Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we are CLF Boston, a hub of the Carbon Leadership Forum and a knowledge community of the BSA. Um, glad that you can join us today. Next, please, Laurel. We're a community of practitioners in the AAC industry. Um, we, we meet regularly, usually in roundtable um, forum, but we have working groups you'll see on the left. And we um, collect and provide resources, tools, and a community, a place where people can talk, ask questions, and learn from each other. Next, please. This impact series, the summer of 2021, builds off of the successful um, Embodied Carbon 101 series of last year. Um, and these are available for you to go back and, and view again if you'd like. Um, but we're happy to continue the conversation um, through building sectors and typologies. In that way, we can talk across disciplines and across the table with owners, developers, and other uh, participants in building our built environment. Next, please. Uh, June is shaping up to be Embodied Carbon Month. We have so much programming this month. Alongside the um, impact series, there are other important conversations happening. Um, on the left, you'll see our roundtable dates. Please join us. Um, their email is, can be made available for you if you want to join the community. And please use the chat um, actively. Pose your questions there. Introduce yourself. Let us know if you're working on something that has to do with embodied carbon. Next, please. And with that, I'm really pleased to introduce Laurel, Jen, and David, who'll talk to us today about embodied carbon and interiors. Thanks, Michelle. So hello, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining us today. My name is Laurel Christensen. I'm an architect and project manager and sustainable design leader at Dyer Brown here in Boston and I'll be moderating our panel discussion today. So I have prepared some questions for our panelists, but again, to echo Rochelle's point, we really encourage you all to add your questions or if you'd like to even raise your hand, uh, we definitely encourage you to turn on your video if you'd like, um, just to engage directly with us since you can take advantage of being part of the live session, not just watching the recording. Um, and again, if you, all, if you all have all the questions, we're happy to answer, ask all of those. Otherwise, I'll have some questions for our panelists at the end. So. Um, these are our learning objectives, and at the end, we're going to kind of come back and um, return to our next steps that we come to throughout the presentation, um, and feel free if you find any kind of salient takeaways you want to make sure get populated into those next steps to drop those into the chat as well. So just a little backstory, um, I had been volunteering with Mindful Materials uh, Collaborative for a couple years, and if you're not familiar with um, Mindful Materials, it's an online database that allows you to find products and materials with certain health and transparency criteria. And uh, I'm part of the A&D Engagement Working Group. And we just meet monthly, similar to CLF Boston Working Groups, um, to kind of share best practices and share um, resources among practitioners all over the country, um, both on using Mindful Materials, but also just in general specifying healthy um, materials with transparency information. And uh, when the EC3 tool was launched, we started getting a ton of questions about embodied carbon and whether embodied carbon data was going to be incorporated into mindful materials. And um, full transparency at the time, uh, frankly, I wasn't that knowledgeable about embodied carbon. And I work on primarily corporate interiors. So, you know, I kind of had this misconception that um, embodied carbon was a conversation that really applied primarily to the folks who are working on structure and overall building systems and um, not really interiors projects like the ones that I worked on. So boy, was I wrong. <laughs> um, so about this time last year, CLF Boston, Rochelle just mentioned, um, did this EC 101 series. And I'll share in the chat here briefly um, the link as well to the interiors portion. But it was at that time that I really learned that embodied carbon on interiors projects due to the lifespan of a building and frequent renovations um, can actually surpass that of the corn shell. And Jen actually was behind some of that research to kind of really make that data available. And she's going to share about a bit about that um, during her presentation as well. Um, but that really sat with me. It made a huge impression on me. And um, fast forward a couple months and uh, as you know, common in TI projects, uh, I got tasked with doing a white box of a marketing suite, a space that was just going to be de demolished and um, 
you know, a blank slate for the next tenant to come in. And when I walked into the space, this is what I saw. So you can imagine I did a little, I had a little cringe and I thought, you know, embodied carbon was kind of top of mind for me at this time. I'm thinking about how can I, you know, reduce waste and, you know, lo and behold, this is a project that a mere 10 years prior had been designed specifically with embodied carbon and reducing waste in mind. Um, and so I wish I could say, I mean, so you can see these were some of the little ads that we put out. I immediately reached out to the CLF network, um, to all of the kind of local Boston networks that I knew um, to try to find a new home for this material. And I wish that there was a better ending to this story, but unfortunately the timeline, the schedule, I'm sure a lot of the barriers you all have all run into on projects um, all just proved to be a bit too much for us to, to uh, accomplish. And we weren't able to salvage it, but um, out of that, a huge, you know, a lot of people started getting really fired up about reuse uh, and salvage specifically in the Boston market. And so we actually were able to form a, a reuse subcommittee um, within the CLF Boston chapter. So our next meeting, kind of shameless self-promotion for our, our subcommittee um, is um, on 624 at 11 a.m. And we'll actually have a guest speaker um, sharing about their experiences kind of growing a reuse market in Indianapolis. So that said, again, that's kind of the backstory on how, um, how I came to this embodied carbon conversation. And I've been so grateful for the CLF um, Boston chapter um, to be really elevating this conversation across, again, all building typologies and all market sectors. And so I'm really excited to hear um, from Jen and David about um, their work and uh, some of their project examples. And then again, just reiterating, please feel free to drop, drop questions in the chat as we go. And with that, I will pass it on to Jen. All right, thanks for that. So I'm Jen. Um, I am from OMN Architects, which is in Seattle. Um, and Laura did a great introduction. I, I think um, I started to ask the question when I heard about embodied carbon being a bigger pie once uh, operational car carbon started to go down as energy um, efficiency building starts to go up. Um, and I asked the question of what can an interior designer like I do if I don't really have that big of an impact? And same thing, once I started looking into it, it was like, oh, well, actually I make a huge impact. So let me really get on this. And this is the study behind that. So I will walk you through um, what we did. Um, so what's on the screen here is Stuart Brand's uh, successes from how buildings learn. And as you can see, there are many layers to a building and the innermost layer are the stuff that interior designers really deal with, the space plan, the stuff. And you can see that they have a higher turnover rate um, when compared to structure and skin. Um, if you go to the next slide. So looking at all of the carbon output of a building, you have the initial carbon or the embodied carbon, which includes of course, envelope and structure as Laurel just mentioned. There's also MVP landscape interiors that's involved. And then you have the operational carbon, um, which is a lot of the energy use once the building is occupied. Then there are other things that are attached to, that, to it that we won't focus too much on. So you can see at the beginning of a building, there's mostly embodied carbon while operational carbon is at zero. If you go to the next slide. Um, but as you continue throughout time, of course, the operational carbon starts to increase throughout the lifetime of the building. And you would think the embodied carbon is once and done, but really when you think about all the renovations and what we're finding for commercial buildings is that's an average of 10 years, which is true in Laurel's case and in our own case study. Um, so that means in every 10 years, the interiors are being renovated, which means it could take on uh, any variety of scope levels. So that continues to increase throughout time. And then at the next slide, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then in Washington state, actually a law, uh, a bill was passed in 2019 that says our grid is going to be zero carbon uh, starting in 2030. And then I think 2030 zero carbon and then 2045, 
I'm sorry, there is a there is a difference between between 30 and 45. But either way, by 2045, it will be zero carbon, in which case you can see that the operational uh, operational carbon actually tapers off. Um, and then the embodied carbon of the building actually continues to be the biggest pie um, in the overall embodied carbon of the building. So as you can see, these blips add up. So what is um, the interior contribution over time. Next, please. So what we did is we looked at our own office um, and its own renovations to understand our impact. Um, one, because we could find old plans and we have people that have been there since the beginning um, and we can find old spec information. So you can see the transformation it's been through. The one in 2013 is the one that is currently sitting empty <laughs> in the Norton building. Um, but we moved into a historic building, Norton building in 1984, um, and then went through uh, these major renovations. And these average out to actually about nine uh, years for every renovation. If you go to the next slide. Um, and what we did is we determined the scope of every renovation, every little thing that we did, how much was demoed, how much was new, it includes things like in 2009, just the restrooms were upgraded. In 2000, there was also an envelope reglazing. Um, so all that was added up. Um, and I don't have a slide for it, but it, this is using the CLF um, uh, TI embodied carbon calculator. And I'll try to find a link later or if someone is able to, we can put that in the chat. But we use that calculator, which essentially um, uh, we took a takeoff of all the materials that we know of, and we assigned an embodied carbon um, value to it at the next slide. That is done by using EPDs. So um, I'm sure at this point we've all asked for EPDs for lead and documentation, but when you really take the next step to look at what is in the EPD, you'll find all the um, environmental impact. And for embodied carbon, we're looking at global warming potential, which um, in this case is 87 for the air on chair, and that's expressed in kilogram um, or equivalent, or sorry, kilogram carbon dioxide or equivalent, I believe. Um, so we took the takeoff of every material and then we put it in the spreadsheet and we added these numbers up together. And then at the next slide, we have the result. Um, so when you look at the initial building, so the building was built in 1959, so at 1960, about there. And the structure in blue takes up most of the embodied carbon. Then we have envelope, and then we have interior. So a lot of times when there's a conversation about interiors, People say, oh, it's only a fraction, it's a 17% or something low like that. But based on when we moved in and when we have the beginning of our remodel data, you can see that the cumulative interior uh, renovation body carbon is also already fairly high um, compared to structure. And this is uh, actually a fairly conservative number because it doesn't talk about any mechanical system any electrical or lighting changes. Um, and there are lots of things like trims and um, sort of little bits and pieces that can't be included in the study. Um, and just FYI, we only used A1 through A3 um, data, which um, if you look at the life cycle, this is just the, the extraction, uh, production and use. So there is no, we thought about including um, uh, D, which is how it is um, disposed of or potentially reused, but it was most of the time in the EPD, it actually lists it as um, energy captured from burning in terms of the D value for embodied carbon, which isn't really helpful. So we didn't include that in our study. So if you go to the next slide, um, so we did our study based on the beginning of our remodel data, which we moved in again, it was like 80 something. 
and then we have actual data starting from 1995. But we can assume that if we're following this 10 year cycle that there would be at least another remodel prior to that. So in that case, when you add that on, um, now the cumulative interior design body carbon is actually higher than structure. And then the next slide. Um, and as uh, technology um, advances, we now can achieve a 30% reduction in concrete mixes. So now if you add envelope and structure, um, to even at that together, the embodied carbon over a 60 year span is still higher than structure and envelope combined. So, um, you know, the most important projects is the one that we're working on now, especially if we're trying to hit the 2030 challenge. So you can see, um, we need to do better now to be able to make sure the future renovations are just going to not accumulate again and again in the worst way possible. Um, and then the next slide, please. So um, while I was doing research, I also started to think about, well, what does that mean? What, what can we do about it? And I think David will have much more detailed information um, on that. But just thinking in terms of circular economy, um, versus linear economy, which is a lot of what we are dealing with right now. We, we extract something, we make it into a product, we put it in the building, and then 10 years later, in Laurel's case, it goes to the dump. Um, but if, if we had, um, I think it was great that that project was done with the thought of being reused later on. Um, and that is a challenge that we're hitting now is like, even if we do that, how do we ensure that it goes back into being used? For example, Harrington. for example, a lot of um, carpet manufacturers say they have Hello? programs. Um, and a lot of times, you know, when I press carpet manufacturers on that, they said, well, actually only six to 7% makes it back to us. So we need to make sure that we put in our specs that um, there is uh, end of use uh, value to the materials and we know where it should be going and we should actively work with our contractors to make sure that that actually happens. But when you have circular economy, you don't have wasted carbon. In a true circular economy, everything that is put into a building is then being reused. So it's recaptured. And I sort of think of it as an investment instead of you know, putting uh, carbon out there and then having it go to waste, you can invest in carbon in a smart way and then have it be within your um, building's life cycle. So really think about it that way would be great. Um, and then the next slide. And this is a, a case study that I found of a company called Davies Office Furniture and Remanufacturing. And what they do is they take existing furniture and then they remanufacture it into something new. So they can take maybe a few different uh, project products and then they make them into something new and they repaint it. And they did a study um, where they showed that their process is only 17% of the embodied carbon versus something that is completely new. Um, and you can see, I won't read it, but there's quite a bit of savings into being able to reuse a material that has already been manufactured into some way that can be um, in the market. Um, and then the next slide. Um, and then also being able to be deconstructed easily and then put back together is also important. This is a steel case chair um, and it was designed to be able to be taken apart in five minutes with just simple tools. So in this case, um, if something breaks, you don't have to throw the whole thing away. You can fix one little uh, component and then put it back together for it to be usable. Go to the next slide. Um, so thinking about how things can be done easily for deconstruction is, maybe think through your connections. If you are using uh, nails, um, it sort of is one and done, but you can't really take it apart with, without damaging the original material. So maybe think about using screws and pins. 
things that can connect clingly together and then be taken apart. And then if you use universal fasteners, that's even better because you will be able to just easily adapt that to a different use later. Um, and instead of using glues, use dissolvable binders. Um, you know, some carpets come with dots now, but so you can install without whole adhesive, things like that. Um, something to think about when you're thinking about how you're connecting your materials together. Um, next. Um, and this uh, is from uh, Reuse Consulting. And I wonder if the wine in Minneapolis is something that they've started. Um, so Dave Benink runs this organization in Seattle and there's a, bit, uh, a few salvage stores that he started. And I know he's been nationwide kind of teaching people how to start this, but he specializes in reuse. And he mentioned that um, a true design for a deconstruction building can be reused up to 98%, which is really high. Um, you can see here, um, he even salvaged this wall, which, which were done by glues and uh, nails, but he said, well, if I can't, take the studs out, I'll save the assembly, and this did go somewhere else. So thinking about that as well would be uh, good um, to uh, think through kind of your design process. You know, as much as as much time as we do or spend putting a building together, we should think at least about the same time, if not half of the time, thinking about how it comes apart <laughs> at the end. Uh, next. Um, so this is just a quick slide thinking about what we can do. A lot of it can go into specification. Um, and there, you, there is the EC3 that Laurel had mentioned. Um, you can think about what your biggest impact is. Um, and I would say, don't wait for building certification. Start asking for transparency, which I think a lot of the projects now are already doing that. And I would say now is the time to then take the next step to compare materials. Um, and EC3 is definitely a tool that will help you do that more easily. Um, there's definitely a lot of EPDs that aren't in EC3 yet, but I think as that populates, this will be a great tool to use. But in the meantime, when you ask for that EPD, go ahead and do the comparison. Um, and then you could, uh, require approved equals to have similar embodied carbon if you have actually selected a material that has better embodied carbon versus their competitors. Um, and then maybe set a carbon max where adequate information is available on certain product categories, which I think for carpet is definitely there. Um, next. Sorry, I feel like I'm taking all the, a lot of time. I'll go quickly. Um, so this is just um, a visual assimilation. Um, so when you look at our 2015 office renovation baseline, this is what it looks like. And one thing that is surprising to us is furniture. Workstation and Herman Miller chair takes up more than half of this chunk. Of course, carpet tile is a big one. Um, we have an open ceiling uh, office, so obviously that's not part of this. Um, but going to the left, if we do have a uh, acoustic panel ceilings, you can see the increase there, what that looks like. It, it adds on um, pretty quickly. And one of the things to do when you're designing is think about what you can remove. Um, do you really need this material? Uh, going to the right is a scenario where you're looking at those EPDs or you're thinking about the embodied carbon, you're picking the lower embodied carbon material. So Say for example, if we used the remanufactured furniture, this is the amount of decrease. If we have the most cutting edge um, low embodied carbon carpet tile, this is the decrease. So you can see how quickly that it almost just by two pro product categories decreased the embodied carbon by half. So we can make a pretty big impact by finding the big offenders and making a difference on those. Um, so that's where I will stop and hand it over to David. Thanks, Jen. You can just jump to the next to the next slide. Yep, thanks. Uh, so hi, everybody. My name uh, is David Cordell. Uh, I'm an interior designer with Perkins and Will in our Washington, D.C. office. Uh, and 
I primarily work, the firm does a lot of different market sectors, but I'm primarily focused on uh, corporate interiors and was part of the design team uh, for our new office, similar to, to Jen, we used our own office as uh, an experiment. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but my, my path to embodied carbon really sort of came through uh, material health. Uh, I'm part of our firm's uh, you know, material performance lab, and we look at, we've been looking at specifying healthy materials for a long time. Uh, and out of that conversation really came this focus on needing to think about embodied carbon with our materials and on our projects. And so if you uh, jump to the next slide, um, because of a, a couple of projects that we were lucky enough uh, to land in the last year in our office that had embodied carbon goals, uh, we really started to come to the realization that we don't just need those kind of specialty clients or ourselves uh, to be the client uh, in order to have an impact on reducing carbon. And so we recently kind of made a, a commitment to changing how we were going to uh, look at all of our design work in our corporate interior studio uh, and try to reduce embodied carbon across the board uh, and committed to really uh, having conversations with our clients about embodied carbon and trying to get to a point where we're presenting every client with a roadmap about how they could get to net zero embodied carbon as part of the design process. Next slide. And so uh, to we kind of set this interim goal of, of 2030 as trying to get uh, to net zero. Uh, and so to help us get there, we've set a series of milestones that we are working towards achieving over time. Uh, and we think these are gonna help us measure our success. Um, but what they're also helping us do is make sure that every single one of our projects is starting to have a positive impact on reducing embodied carbon right out of the gate, uh, instead of just focusing on, on a few projects uh, with high potential. Because we think you know one project is great, but if you have 30 projects at least making some sort of impact on reducing embodied carbon, that's going to be even better, right? So uh, we really started uh, doing this in earnest earlier this year uh, and have been talking to manufacturers, trying to help us understand what they're doing to reduce embodied carbon and ensure that there will be a, a supply chain uh, to help us get to this 2030. Um, and by the end of this year, every project that we've designed this year will have optimized uh, embodied carbon in at least one of the materials on the project. Uh, and that's helping our studio and our staff gain a literacy and how to read, uh, excuse me, how to read EPDs. Uh, and so by the end of 2022, uh, we'll, be committed, we'll be doing a full life cycle assessment on all of our projects. Uh, the goal is that we'll be reducing embodied carbon on all of our projects by 50% by 2025. Uh, and then uh, by 2030, uh, getting as close to zero as we can and having conversations about what the role uh, offsets will be uh, with all of our clients. Uh, you know, we know that there will always be some energy associated with our, with our, uh, with our work, you know, with construction and with transportation, there'll always be something. Um, but the goal is to reduce that threshold as much as possible so that it becomes very achievable to get to net zero uh, with offsets. Next slide. And so there are a few things that we're doing to really change our approach. Uh, we're holding ourselves accountable to this. Uh, uh, we're changing what our design considerations are, uh, building our liter literacy with a few tools, uh, and also partner alignment. Next slide. Um, so in terms of accountability, uh, we're assigning every project now gets an embodied carbon champion. Uh, and part of their role is helping the team identify uh, strategy or opportunities for reducing embodied carbon right out of the gate on a project. Um, and we're also committing to talking about embodied carbon with our clients. So as we talk about design strategies, as we talk about the materials that we're selecting, we really want to start having conversations with our clients about why we've, <clears throat> excuse me, why we've selected those materials uh, and how much uh, that selection is reducing embodied carbon on the project. Uh, and at the end of every project, we'll be delivering a report to the client 
uh, to help them understand how the project is performing against baseline and how far away from zero they are. Next slide. And so we realize that we need to think about uh, our designs differently in order to achieve this. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of overlaps here with what Jen was just talking about. But uh, first and foremost, uh, we really need to start thinking about our buildings almost as material banks and look at where we can take uh, things that are already in, uh, have been constructed uh, and reuse or repurpose those. Uh, we know, uh, you know, lots of times there are opportunities to use less materials. Uh, so the the lowest embodied carbon product is the one that's never built, right? So uh, the less materials that we can use, um, the the more it will help us with that. But we also know that we're going to have to specify some materials. We'll have to do some construction in order to meet our clients' needs. And so looking to manufacturers that have responsible manufacturing processes uh, or uh, salvage materials, carbon sequestering materials, uh, giving priority to those uh, when we do have to specify new material. Uh, and then again, similar to what Jen was, was talking about designing uh, both for durability and thinking about designing for reuse and how we can better support a circular economy so that uh, at the end of life of a project, those materials aren't just going into a landfill, but they're either going back to manufacturers through buyback, buyback programs uh, so that they become stock for manufacturing uh, or reused in some other way. Next slide. Uh, I mentioned a couple of times, uh, you know, we're really focusing on our staff's literacy with the tools that we need in order to achieve this. Uh, Mindful Materials is a great uh, tool for us in terms of locating products that have EPDs. Uh, and we've already talked about Tally and EC3 as tools to help us understand uh, the actual embodied carbon of our projects. Next slide. And this slide is really meant as a, as a call to arms uh, because we think that for real change to happen, uh, we need to have an institutional shift. Uh, and we need to focus on making improvements throughout the entire construction industry because there's no chance that we're going to be able to reduce embodied carbon just simply as designers alone. We really need to work not only with our supply chain, but with building owners and building operators to think about how we can change the process uh, because it needs to happen at a macro scale. You know, the people who are who are you know, financing and investing development deals all the way down to the, the person that's installing the carpet tile. Uh, and that's how we'll create a, a market demand for lower carbon products um, and start to encourage building owners and clients to engage us you know, sort of at the early, early stage or depending on how you're looking at it at the end of a life uh, of, of a space uh, so that we can start to do uh, material audit uh, before demolition starts and identify opportunities for reuse. Um, because I think the scenario that Laurel talked about at the beginning where there's a, there's a, a space that was designed to be uh, disassembled and reused is a very real one, right? If the design team isn't re-engaged at the end of that, who's holding all of that knowledge uh, that went into that design? So the big takeaway from this slide is really just that we can play our role as designers uh, but that uh, everybody along the chain kind of really needs to do their part. Next slide. Uh, so what does reducing embodied carbon look like? Next slide. Uh, so I mentioned that we had the opportunity to use our own office uh, as a guinea pig for this process. Um, we are just finishing up um, construction now. So. Um, we're just now starting to be able to occupy the space. It's an 11,000 square foot uh, office space here in DC. Uh, we were involved in repositioning the building from a parking garage into, um, into an office building. Uh, and we knew that you know, we wanted flexibility. We knew that we also wanted to push the envelope with sustainability. And so we're pursuing a number of certifications in that. Uh, so if we, fingers crossed, if we, if we get it all, uh, the project is tracking LEED Gold, uh, Well Platinum, Fitwell Three Stars, 
uh, and living building challenge pedal certification for materials pedal, which is where the part of the embodied carbon story comes in. Next slide. Uh, so fortunately, since everybody loved the, um, you know, the aesthetic of the building and we're architects, so we want to express the structure of the building and see the concrete. Uh, for us, it was a, an easy decision to uh, be thoughtful about where we were applying materials. So you'll see in these renderings where it's appropriate, there's a lot of exposed slab, a lot of uh, exposed columns. Um, you know, I think it's an interesting conversation that's come up a couple of times about are we trading off material health, uh, or sorry, are we trading off health and comfort uh, strategies, especially to the well building standard in order to achieve some of this. Uh, and I think it's, it's a balance, like so many things in life, but I, I think uh, you know, embodied carbon and, and climate change is such a huge impact on on human health that I think, you know, you're to say you're uh, being thoughtful about how much of materials you're using is is in, in an effort to reduce embodied carbon is uh, not saying that you're not paying attention to human health. I don't think it has to be one or the other. So sorry, that was my soapbox. I went off on a <laughs> I went off on a tangent there, but. Um, so we thought about material reduction. We also thought about um, limiting our material palette and really focusing on uh, materials like wood that sequester carbon. Uh, go ahead and jump to the next one. Um, and being creative you know, uh, about what we built out of millwork in an effort to do that and where there were sort of millwork finishes uh, where wood wasn't appropriate, such as countertops, uh, we looked to sort of, uh, very durable materials with low embodied carbon, large format porcelain tile uh, is what a lot of our countertops ended up being uh, for a durability standpoint, because we know that that's going to be there for the length of this lease and that we're not going to have to replace countertops uh, with less more durable materials over the course of time. Um, next slide. Um, we also really looked carefully at uh, the, the manufacturers that we specified uh, for a lot of the big products. Um, you know, we tried to focus on, we didn't have a huge number of materials in the space, but uh, what we do have a lot of is drywall, insulation, carpet, and in the open office space, ceiling tile. So those are kind of the four top materials in terms of, of, of quantity on the project. So we really uh, looked to manufacturers that have mis responsible manufacturing programs uh, through carbon offsets uh, or our furniture, everything except the workstations is reused. So from the old office, so we refurbished some of it, some of it was uh, in good shape and we were able to move it over um, directly as is. So that helped as well. Next slide. Uh, and we did also think about designing for reuse. So the way that we tackled glass uh, throughout the space is it's all demountable uh, systems. Uh, again, that was a very careful uh, balance between getting the acoustic performance that we needed to comply with well, uh, and also the demountable systems, but that gives us the ability to reuse that, those unitized systems in the future. Uh, and uh, a lot of the, the products like carpet and ceiling tiles were uh, from manufacturers that have buyback programs. So again, helping to support the circular economy through that. Uh, and then my last slide, uh, this is the uh, one of the Sankey diagrams that we had from uh, EC3 uh, that Jen kind of introduced earlier. Um, you know, but, and this was from one of our early studies, but it, it helped us sort of realize that we were, uh, you know, the possibility to reduce the embodied carbon given the material streams that we were looking at, which excluded furniture uh, and MEP. Uh, but we realized that you know, it was possible through uh, responsible material selection to uh, significantly reduce embodied carbon. And we're actually tracking, this is showing 56, we're, we're at about, we're right at about that with our preliminary um, LCAs based on final material selections and quantities. So we think our baseline had us uh, a little bit shy of uh, 900 tons of carbon for the space and we're coming in at about 440. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. So uh, I think that's my final slide. So I'll turn it back to you, Laurel. Thank you. Thank you both. 
Um, okay, so let's see, I stopped sharing so we can all just see each other's faces. And if you're tuning in, please feel free to turn on your camera. And again, like I said, I'd love to encourage you all to um, interact directly. We had a couple of questions that came in. So um, before I jump into my questions, I wanna make sure we get all the audience questions answered first. Um, Gina, did you want to ask your question live? I won't put you on the spot if you don't. I'm happy to ask it for you. <laughs> sure, no problem. Um, I mean, thanks so much for this content, everybody, and for your work. Um, we've been using Tally at our office, and um, what has been a little bit difficult to wrap our brains around are the items that aren't accounted for in Tally, specifically mill work. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering, like, Obviously I can just do takeoffs and go brute force at it with a spreadsheet, um, but I'm wondering if there have been other methods that have worked for, for any of our presenters or anybody. Yeah, mill work is hard. Um, it's sort of the same as furniture. Um, I think what we've done for mill work is sort of just use the, because I think Tally uses the generic industry average um, for wood. Um, so you might just take a uh, take off of that and then put that through a tally. Um, we sort of did the same thing for furniture where we just took the volume of MDF that we know of that's in our furniture to at least attach a color or a, a number to that and then use the industry average EPD for that. But yeah, I don't, currently I don't know if there's a, a super easy way to do that. Thanks. Yeah, it hasn't been super straightforward. I think I found from the EPDs that um, if, if my math is right, then I found that solid surfaces can be like eight to 10 times more carbon than a PLAM counter. So now I'm just like, oh my gosh, yeah. switch everything back to PLAM. Yeah, one thing with millwork that was funny too, um, I think if it's wood, EPD counts it as sequestering. So it actually has a negative number. Um, and I was doing a study where I try to make the cycles more frequent than the standard um, cycle in tally. And it ended up saying that I have a negative, a bunch of embodied carbon just because it's saying, oh, you're saving it every time. So there's also that danger in, in looking at tally that way. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Gina. Actually, um, this kind of brings me to a question that I had. And David, I appreciated your comment about like the trade-offs between material health and embodied carbon. And I know that for a lot of us, like we kind of came from the material health side and that's what introduced us to the embodied carbon discussion. So I'm just wondering uh, for both of you, if you can just speak a little bit to the synergies between occupant health and wellness, energy efficiency and embodied carbon uh, when it comes to interiors. Yeah, so I mean, our approach for our office was um, to think about the space in terms of where are people working and spending long periods of time and where what are the spaces that are more uh, transient. Uh, and, you know, a lot of wells requirements, especially when it comes to comfort and things are focused on regularly occupied spaces. Uh, and so that start, started for us to set up a prior, uh, a hierarchy, I guess, uh, for which spaces need, needed to be really focused on um, sort of occupant comfort and productivity, which tended to be our heads down workspaces, our open office and our, you know, the focus rooms like I'm in now, uh, and which spaces um, could, for lack of a better term, be more embodied carbon focused in terms of the amount of materials. Um, but I do, th I, I do think holistically overall, it's not by fo choosing to focus on embodied body carbon, you're not throwing occupant health out the window. Um, because again, uh, you know, it's all going to support uh, climate change. And if we don't turn things around, then all the healthy materials in the world aren't going to help us if it's, um, you know, we have no food left because we've killed all of our crops. Uh, so I, I, I think it's, it's, yes and versus a one or the other conversation. Yeah, when I was doing the research, I eventually was thinking that, oh, I'm gonna research myself out of a job because we just shouldn't build anything. But um, like David said, it's not 
human beings are still here and we're needing buildings and we still need them to function and support what we're doing in them. Um, but I think a lot of times taking that extra time to look into what materials you're putting in um, and choosing materials that you know the ingredients of, which a lot of times uh, healthy materials require. Um, a lot of times you'll find that that actually has lower body embodied carbon also because it means the manufacturer is looking into what goes into their build or what goes into their product. So I think just asking those questions and making sure that when you do have to put something in your building, it is the, the best case scenario that supports the health and well-being, but also it has the lowest embodied carbon um, is where we should go. So health and embodied carbon goes hand in hand and it's what we should use to vet our materials. Great, great point. Um, okay, another question, Lisa, I'm gonna ask this one for you. Um, for David, how do clients respond to your embodied carbon reports that you're sharing with them, especially if they're like unsolicited, right? Like you didn't uh, necessarily tell them this was part of their project. Um, are these delivered alongside energy reduction information? And is it something that they get excited about? Um, so at the moment, uh, we're still on that early phase, right? So the, the clients that we're having these conversations with are um, the ones that are, are focused on on embodied carbon already. Um, by the, it's by the end of next year that we really wanna be at a point where we're, we're giving a report to every client. Um, our firm though does already track uh, sustainable performance on all of our projects. So all of our projects, uh, we report out uh, energy, uh, water consumption. We re already report out on material health and we already report out on resilience, and that's across the board. That's for uh, you know a small corporate interior project all the way up to a hospital. Uh, and so, for us, um, embodied carbon is just another lens that we're adding to this overall kind of project performance uh, tool that we use that we we talk about. So, I think. Uh, nobody's responding to it negatively. We are already starting to have conversations about specific materials that we're specifying. And I think, um, you know, nobody's, I, I can't imagine that anybody's going to respond negatively to that. I think, um, you know, occasionally there's somebody who says, well, as long as it doesn't cost me more money. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, so many manufacturers are coming online with, uh, in low embodied carbon materials that don't cost anymore now that that's becoming an easier and an easier conversation. So uh, I, I think it's talking about it in terms of positive, this is the impact. I also think um, it's, you know, I just mentioned uh, that we're at what, 900 tons was our baseline uh, for CO2 for, uh, for our project. Nobody knows what the hell that means, right? Like. Does that sound good? Does that sound bad? So it's finding a way to convert that into something that means something to the client, and then they can sort of wrap their emotional head around the the positive impact that their project is doing. So one of the things that we do now is we we talk about the carbon, uh, and then there's a converter that we found online. I have no idea if it's scientifically based or not, but it it converts it to the number of trees or acres of a forest and how much CO2 uh, those trees would remove. And so that's at least something that you can say, okay, that you know the carbon that we've reduced from this project is the, the equivalent of you know 16 acres of forest, and that allows people to feel really, really good and positive about the materials and the design strategies that they're buying off on. So I think, uh, you know, when we talk about it in that kind of humanistic way, uh, it helps sort of dodge any negative uh, implications that somebody may have. Michelle, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, I wanted to circle back to a comment that Philippe shared earlier in the chat about the challenge of um, reusing steel um, because of schedule considerations, and and that is a real world, you know, real life world issue. So just thinking a bit about how we can um, fold that into a process. Yeah, I, I think, um, David, I think it was you who said um, 
that we could really think of our buildings as material banks. And you spoke to that idea of doing like a material audit earlier in the project. And I think it really does speak to, which both of you touched on, like how are we rethinking our design process and how are we considering like what actually phase of the project we're in? Are we in the beginning of the phase or are we in the end phase? And um, yeah, having that conversation with all the stakeholders to understand the schedule impacts and, and the budget impacts and, and the value of spending that extra time and money. I think a lot of it is just uh, really being loud about the fact that this is something that you are thinking about. You know, tell the contractors that you're working with, tell the, you know, the building owners that you're working with, the, um, you know, the, the, the clients that you have. Um, especially general contractors, uh, you know, since we've been talking about this publicly, this commitment uh, since March, we've had multiple general contractors reach out to us that aren't involved in the project that, you know, that we're on right now, but they're involved in demoing a space. And they know that this is something that Perkins and Will is thinking about. And so they're like, hey, I had somebody email the other me the other day and he said, I have 20 solid core wood doors and I know that, you know, Perkins and Will is trying to focus on embodied carbon. I have no idea, you know, if they'll work for you or your project or if this is, but I just thought I would reach out. So I think the more that we can communicate that this is something that we're thinking about and that is important to us, I think more, the more of those serendipitous kind of uh, chances. And then we just have to figure out how to make that work, right? How to roll it into our projects. Um, specifically to the back steel question, I don't have an immediate solution. I, it is a tricky one. Um, but I think the, the more that we can start thinking about that, that material bank, uh, buildings as material banks concept, I think the easier that will get because it's probably there, right? It's probably three blocks away in a building that's getting ready to be demolished. And it's just nobody has a way of tracking that right now or sharing that information. Oh, yes. We have uh, actually right here in Boston, a tool that's uh, in the works that's in development that's called Building Ease. And the intent of that tool is essentially to do just that. Um, and I see now that it's 354. And so I'm going to take the I'm going to take control here again um, and share my screen again quickly so that we can kind of distill down some of the things that we learned and also leave you all with some really salient kind of next steps. Like how can you take this? What can you do today? What can you do tomorrow with, with the information that we've learned? Um, so I know Rochelle uh, and Lisa have been taking some notes. So I'll let them share those, um, those next steps in just one second. I guess as a wrap up, I was also taking a couple of my own kind of key points that were my top takeaways. Um, Jen, I loved how you said that we, you know, we're going to be spending the carbon regardless. So we could think about like, can we think about it, how we can invest in it in a smart way? That was a really great um, kind of shift. Um, and then I also love don't wait for certifications to start asking for transparency. We can start asking now. That's something that all of us can do. You know, we're talking to manufacturers on a daily basis. Easy, very easy. If we're not already asking to ask for that transparency information. Um, and I will say from working with mindful materials, like the more that manufacturers hear this from designers all, all across the country, um, you know, we have the specifying power. And so it's, it's easy to forget that and say, oh, it's not out there. But if you didn't ask and, you know, your, your counterpart in another office didn't ask then they don't know you wanted it. Um, so that really goes a long way. And then, um, David, some of the points I love from you were, we really don't need those special clients or we don't have to be our own client, right? To start reducing embodied carbon. Um, we can consider it on all projects, no matter the scale. Um, and I particularly liked your goal of like looking at just one product uh, or one material per project. Um, and then, you know, starting to build that kind of institutional knowledge amongst your firm. Um, and then lastly, again, I love that point about thinking of our buildings as material banks um, and, and really, you know, doing, doing more, a bit more due diligence, right, when we do our first kind of site walks or field verifications um, to really kind of dig into what can we salvage, um, what local companies might be interested in these doors or this millwork, right, um, because they're out there. So, all right, Rochelle, do you want to give us our strategies for in our next steps? 
Laurel, your summation really covered a lot of this ground here. Um, so I won't belabor the points and read every everything, but I think the the sort of holistic circularity thinking, thinking about whether we need it at all, or if we could reuse something, or if we could do without um, having a firm wide strategic plan, you know, that that we attack materials or do stepwise or low hanging fruit um, to start to gather information and build the in house knowledge get the data regardless of, of whether it's in an EPD or an ASK or through LCA tools. Um, we're, we're designers, we're in the AAC industry, but we, we need to be advocates. And that means along the supply chain and with your client and with um, the, the greater, greater community, greater industry. I think it's really effective in providing broader information and, and just at least planting the seed if someone hasn't thought about this before or hasn't been asked before. Um, and shifting to the second page, um, there's also maybe what I was hearing, maybe an industry-wide need to develop more accurate information about the materials that show up in interiors work, the millwork, the, the counters, the furniture, get to that granularity and, and um, start to develop that data. So maybe that's a, a broader CLF type of conversation that we can, um, we can have. And if anyone wants to add any other points, I think we'll be sharing this information out later in an email. Um, please feel free to, to, you know, add your thoughts to the chat and we'll, we'll save the chat certainly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know we had a couple of folks who joined a little bit late, so we'll have, we'll share the slides, we'll have the recording available. And again, I encourage everyone, if you didn't see um, the EC 101 session on interiors, that's also a great one. Um, Andrew Ellsworth with Doors Unhinged um, has a similar uh, company that, that salvages doors specifically. Um, and I know Lisa mentioned in the chat, Boston Building Resources. I do wanna just plug them as well. If you are in Boston and you're working on any projects, they're a great uh, organization that will come. They'll give your client or your contractor a tax write-off for donating or salvaging those materials. Um, so they're again, just a, another great resource to, to take advantage of. So thank you all for joining us and we really appreciate your time and looking forward to seeing where, uh, where this in information takes you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.